Welcome back to Coffee Sometimes. I'm one of your hosts, Ethan Joseph Rivers. The Joseph comes from my grandfather. Really? Joseph Rivers. Was he a good man? He is a good man. Hey, okay. 90 years young, baby. Still kicking. Yep. Central Florida. Where you at? All my Eustis homies or you, Matilla. Comment below. Comment below. Um, and I'm with uh, with some friendly faces. Two Walters. Karen K. Walters. <laughs> Ross Gordon Walters. Here. At present. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome to the Coffee Sometimes podcast. Um, we have a great episode lined up today. Um, we're going to be interviewing Ross's mom. Karen. <laughs> Mostly going to be like Ross diaper stories. So yep. buckle in for the next, uh, you know, two three hours. Uh, there's a lot of nuance <laughs> to get to. <laughs> there's going to there's be a lot we're going to explore. Um, but no, we're gonna we're just going to talk about Karen's professional life, her professional journey, um, how she's played a role in Valor and helped us along the way. Um, yeah, we're probably this taking a little break from our normal flow of book talk and um, Q and A. This is just going to be more, uh, a little more hmm. interview style. Interview style. It's wow. more of a conversation. More of a conversation. So I say, let, let the, the conversation, conversation begin. begin. <laughs> okay. Um, before we just jump in, how are you both? I'm wonderful. I feel honored to be here. Oh, Care Bear. Karen. Uh, oh, and you heard that, Care Bear. You, you're a listener, right? I, yes. Colson and I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Colson, you're on next, buddy. We're going we're gonna to hear about your professional career, you your yeah. journey. Um, do, you, do we call Karen Care Bear on the podcast, or is that? I'm just going to, I think it's whatever flows, whatever is natural. You yeah, a lot of options. It might be mom, it might be mommy, it might be Care Bear, it might be <laughs> K Bay. K Bay, might be Karen. I go I like K Bay, but um yeah. Karen, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Yeah, thank you. I'm a big fan. I feel honored to be here and I'm feeling great. Tuesday morning, long weekend, lots of fun. Wow. Good stuff. Thank you. I I must say I think you might be Fowler's biggest fan. Yeah, I don't wanna, you know, there's other parents involved. Um, we all love you and respect each of you. Mm. So, yeah, there's no, yeah. There's no need to do this like weird like ranking thing. Ethan. Yeah, no, no shade to my parents, so. but Karen, I mean, <laughs> you're you're in, you're in. Yeah, I love all of you. I love listening to your voices. So I have it on in the background. Mm. What are we drinking this morning? Great question. Well, we brewed it up uh, together. Um, yep. Sometimes we make pour overs. Sometimes. We actually rarely make espresso drinks for us. Yeah, that's true. Too maybe, quick. Maybe next week. Maybe next week we'll make an espresso beverage. Um, this is just a batch brew of free throw, right? Free throw. 80% Brazilian pea berry, 20% um, Honduras La Unica. Mm -hmm. Natural process. Natural process. I think it's probably, as far as iterations, iterations of uh, free throw, it is... Super, super enjoyable, super like mellow. Sometimes we'll throw on that uh, world famous Worka Sakaro anaerobic Ethiopia natural, yeah. and it makes free throw very like in your face, very yep. progressive. But this is more like easy drinking. Yep. And for a day like this, I'll take it. I think this is more true to what free throw should be, personally. 100%. Because it, it's got that fruity pop, but it's not a very high acidity fruity pop. Karen, do you like coffee? I do now. Did I, your did your son help you with that, or his, did he I, have nothing to do with it? He had something to do with it. I gradually, you know, got into it, but I do like the free throw. Free throw. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm drinking this with a unique perspective this morning because after I dropped my kid off at school this morning, I went to the Human Bean. <laughs> Tell us more. Um, because. I just love tasting coffee from non-specialty coffee shops because I love to convert customers from non-specialty shops to ours 
or just to like drinking specialty in general. And so I like to understand like sometimes like drink. I was more excited about ordering that coffee from human bean than I have been in a long time. You were excited. Yes. I was, I was really excited because Did you wait in line. There was no line. No offense to human bean. Hey, no, no, it was drive through. Well, that's why I was wondering because it was probably what? Like eight, eight, eight. It was nine o'clock in the morning. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. It was no. It, it was, was like eight. Th- it was eight thirty. Yeah. Eight thirty. Anyways, so I love to have coffees on our menu that are a better version of what people are used to drinking, you know, in a more commodity grade context. So yeah. that was exciting for me. Um, but anyways, you don't want you want to tell us what it tasted like. It tasted. I mean. The coffee on our menu that is similar to it is Worker's Comp, which is our dark-ish roast, but it's a, a really nice coffee that we roast uh, a bit darker. Um, yeah. And I think in contrast to Worker's Comp, Worker's Comp has more sweetness and a little bit more acidity, but the main thing, the main like impetus behind Worker's Comp is it tastes like a dark roast without all of the negative aspects of a dark roast. Yeah. And I think that the coffee this morning had negative aspects to it, like kind of this uh, almost like stale cigarette thing going on. Not that I smoke cigarettes, Mom. I don't do that. Good catch. Oh, I'm relieved. Yeah. <laughs> so just, yeah. But um, yeah. But you're, you're one to indulge non-specialty coffee. Yeah. Even like just if you're in a scenario where you would want coffee. Yeah. You'll drink whatever is available. Yeah. Karen, would you, would you just drink any coffee that is served to you or do you not routinely need coffee so you're you're a little more choosy? I drink Valor coffee. That's the right answer. <laughs> That's the right answer I, right there. I'm closer to Karen. I think I don't know if we've ever talked about this on air, but I just don't really Drink other coffee. Yeah. Uh, I'll drink other specialty coffee, mm-hmm. and I'll try a sip of Ross's Human Bean. That honestly, he comes in with it a little more than you would think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was on a bus this weekend on the way to a gig, and they had a bus flex. Keurig on the the bus, and I had two huge cups of mcdonald's mccafe french roast mm. and it was i mean it was i don't regret it it wow. it's just a different product it's a different category for me um but i say we jump right in to getting uh, to know care bear what yeah. do you think Ethan? i'd say you introduce your mother tell tell us a little bit of what 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 qualifies karen for well this podcast if, if somebody was to ask you, which somebody is, and it's me right now, yes. ask you what it is that you do for work, what would you say? I am newly self-employed. I am a human resources consultant. So I ta- I'm passionate about taking the wisdom that I've gained in my career and offering it up to small to medium-sized businesses. Amazing. That, that was succinct. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. I love that. And I actually... It cannot be overstated how hard it is to summarize what you do in a concise and interesting way. I'm serious. It's something I've always struggled to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's easy in one sense because it's like I own a coffee company. Right. But like to, I guess to a wholesale partner or somebody I'm trying to sell to, like summing up, is that something that you have worked on? Mm-hmm. Summarizing like what you just said. Yeah, I probably say it differently each time, so I don't have, you know, one tagline necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, it's evolving. Tell me this. Can you define human resources? What is HR? Mm, it's a old, stodgy term, and I think it conjures up some thoughts that I don't really love. Yeah. So... I like to think of it as a different profession altogether. But human resources for me in my career, I think it typically conjures up ideas like, oh, these are people to be fearful of. And that's it's actually the opposite of that. 
Hmm. It's uh, somebody who's a good listener and who's a good um, advocate of the company and the associate. So it's looking, it's a business person who's looking at the people strategy. And, but again, HR personnel, I think we all are familiar with the, how that's evolved over time. You know, sometimes people think of it as the payroll person or the, yeah. the com- HR compliance, the legal, the fear, the risk. But I, I look at it much more holistically. What is the relationship between a low-level employee, an executive, and the HR person? Mm. Like, do, do, is mm. the HR person the middle person in between those two people? Are they the advisor to the executive? Are the, like, can yeah. you talk about it in those terms? Yeah, I think it's all of that. So for the the frontline person, it's a safe person that uh, to talk with because I, you know, if you do want to look at it from a, a compliance or legal risk standpoint. A company doesn't want uh, the employee to not feel like there's a safe person. So, because otherwise they would go externally to the EEOC. Uh, what is that? Uh, an external agency that uh, adjudicates fairness for employers and, okay. and discrimination and things like that. Whoa. So, that's not where you would want them to go or to an attorney. So, f- from that standpoint it's a, a safe person who's um su- you know just objective well and the outside agency doesn't understand the organization in a way right. that the hr person would right yeah so i think the hr person for the employee is you know an encourager and it's a safe person and it's somebody who can give feedback and help and and propel their career and yeah all all things for the executive mm-hmm. i think it's similar but it's a trusted advisor Somebody who again can give helpful feedback without fear of uh, retribution. <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's a safe, trusted advisor on all sides. Yeah, lovely. Where did you uh, where did you garner your experience in HR? Hmm. I haven't moved around a lot, so yeah, you've I, been. A- I'm a loyal sort. Yeah. I start, I fell into HR when I was a college student. I did not know what that term meant. I asked my dad, what is human resources? Because there was an inter- internship available. And I th- my dad said, I don't know, but I think it has something to do with benefits. So that's the beginning. There it is. I was an intern uh, at the age of 19. I worked for Unisys, which is a... Fortune 50 worldwide. Still? Or just at, at the time? At the time. Yeah, okay. Fortune 50. That's, Fortune, that's not 500, Fortune 50. So I worked uh, for an, an IT consulting firm for a long time. I grew up there. So I learned from some really awesome HR professionals there. And uh, then I moved to a local enterprise uh, led by Arthur Blank, the Atlanta Falcons, and that whole suite of businesses. So yeah, I just went from not knowing what the term meant to learning from some really awesome people and then blossoming um, under Arthur's leadership. Yeah. I can see how different parts of your personality, like I I get how you went down that path. Yeah. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And it's it's great because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Hmm. And that's just the way it went. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been at two companies and now you started your own. (laughs) That's correct. Yeah. Lovely. How long were you at Unisys? uh, Probably like, I forget, 14 years, maybe 13. Oh, my stars. Yeah. I literally grew up. From 19. Yeah. 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 Did you get recruited by Arthur Blank or did you just like apply for a job? There uh, there was a uh, posting. Yeah. So they were posting for a human resources manager and... I thought it might be nice to leave Unisys because I had become very, very good at some of the aspects of HR that are not as fun um, with like what? downsizing and, you know, being a layoffs, layoffs. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, so they were posting for an HR manager and it was an interesting process to interview with the Falcons because I think they, at that time, Arthur had just purchased the team 
And they were really just starting a human resources function because the Smith family didn't have that uh, type of function, a real a robust function. So uh, in reading the description, it, it said some things that like running the birthday list. And, you know, so yeah, I, yeah. I think at that time they didn't necessarily know what they needed because it was new. And so it was a three month journey of interviewing for wow. them and and figuring out between the both of us, you know, that this was a good fit. It took three months to interview with the Falcons. Yes. What, first of all, why do you think it took that long? And what sorts of things do you remember as far as what they asked you Mm. and what you asked them? I know it was a while ago. Oh, the gentleman that interviewed me was a professional. He was a career executive headhunter who was in leadership there at the Falcons and so he was very good at what he did. And the interview struck me. <laughs> when I left, I real thought about what I had said, and I was struck by how much I had said. So he was very good at getting me to open oh. up. Mm. I remember him asking me what I'm passionate about, and I didn't have a great answer because at that time in my life, I had no idea what I was passionate about. Interesting. And so and it was a very fluid uh, discussion that I was prepared for, but nothing that I was going to say was said. Okay. That's, that is really profound. You, nothing that you were going to say was said. And you think that was because he was a great interviewer. Yes. That's a good piece of wisdom right Right there. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Well, what's interesting to me is that he's, this guy's a pro and it still took three months. So it's, there's gotta be so much more than just like gut feeling. Right. Oh gosh. Right. I do think I was the first person that um, they interviewed, and I was just speaking with this gentleman literally like three days ago. We were catching up, and oh wow, yeah, yeah. So he probably had some reservations about me because I was coming from a place that where I didn't have feel a lot of passion, Uh, but through that process, uh, it was much like a courtship during that three months. Meaning I. And maybe this is some to advi- advice to some uh, people out there who are on the job market is I courted them and mm. I sold myself over that three month period. I, I wrote up, I'll say white paper type thing documents and proactively showed them what I thought could happen uh, in the, in the function and in my role, almost educating back and forth. And mm. so I feel a not to boast, but I feel like I earned it at the end of the three months because I was um, sharing, you know, even quotes from feedback I'd gotten over the years. And mm, nice. it, so it wasn't just one interview. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you've earned everything you've got in your Aww. life, Care Bear. Thank You're you. amazing. Thank you. Um, I want to, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Okay. Um, but, and, and a lot of it's about, the things that you are doing in your business now. Yes. Because, I mean, you've just taken this like classic BA route of, you know, like getting all this experience in these respected companies and then taking all of that and applying it in your own way to other people and starting your own business, which I just think is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, But before we talk about that, I want to talk about What that like the Arthur Blank family of businesses was like when you first started versus now, like with the Mercedes Benz Stadium and, you know, all this crazy growth. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've heard you say over the years that there's they were like two totally like same values, but they've grown a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to wrap my head around like what was an NFL team like in the front office like 20 years ago, you know, versus now? Yeah, that's a good question. So when I joined, it was a small group of people because an NFL team, there's 32 teams, but each team, even though it feels large and the visibility is large, it's a small group of people. And Arthur did a great job of instilling the Home Depot type core values because Arthur, for those who don't know Arthur Blank, he's the co-founder of Home Depot. And he and Bernie Marcus... Uh, grew the Home Depot from one store to what it is today uh, based on a a group of core values. And I think those core values, 
evolved over time. He, you know, they came from how they were raised and they came from the tough lessons learned. And a lot of people know that Arthur and Bernie were fired from a store called Handy Dan. And uh, not many people have heard of Handy Dan, but they've heard of Home Depot. And so, yeah, yeah. so they moved on from that and grew Home Depot into what it is. And, and so we were the beneficiaries of that wisdom because Arthur knew he wasn't finished when he left Home Depot. He wanted to do a lot of new things and he wanted to buy an NFL team and he had already purchased a couple guests or a guest ranch rather out in Montana. And so we were the beneficiaries of that wisdom in that the NFL team was run. It was really transformed by those philosophies. And then, as you say, over time, uh, a lot of other businesses came on board. So, uh, so we have a soccer team for for those who are soccer fans. Atlanta United, and Arthur has an amazing foundation, and there are now two guest ranches out in Montana, plus a golf course and some other things, and PGA Tour Superstores. That's a over fifty retail stores across country, and then Oof. as you say, Mercedes Benz Stadium. So I think in the beginning it was a lot about from an HR standpoint setting up the HR function, and doing some culture building and becoming, it was really game day to game day, how to put on a great game day experience and how to impact the community in a positive way. But we were small, as I said, but then over time we grew and we evolved. We even had an arena football team for a short while. Oh yeah. 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 And, um, arena football. Yeah. So we even had some (laughs) physical therapy centers. So, Working there, the consistent thread, of course, is the core values because it doesn't matter if it's a hardware store or a sports organization or a guest ranch in Montana. It just doesn't matter and, or a coffee company. It's Those are the core values. Because the people are running all those things, yeah. right? Is that why it doesn't matter? Yeah, it's because you have to have a, a compass through which you know to make decisions. And, and as you guys talk about the guardrails of behavior, and so that it just doesn't matter what industry you're in. And so I think it was just a lot of forming uh, when in the early days, growing and innovating and collaborating. Those are m- my biggest memories of working there, are just the profound innovation and profound collaboration uh, within that culture. And But the big lessons learned, and I think the stuff that inspired me to do what I'm doing right now came when Mercedes-Benz was contemplated years ago. And if you think about it, it's it's the culture, the risk of culture dilution mm. because we were the size of a pea and then we were starting or, you know, and operating a stadium, which is basically like, you know, like a shopping mall. Like you have plumbers and you have yeah. engineers and you have... Uh, sound and and all of the, uh, the just the physical aspects of running a facility and all the people that make that happen. So it would be like Valor, probably not as much like this, but Valor acquiring Starbucks, and then you want your culture to be. How do you do that? Yeah, mm. yeah. Can you define culture dilution? Culture dilution would be, and it was the same thing they had at Home Depot. I'll take that as an example. So they had one store, and then they had two stores, and then they had 10 stores, or whatever it was. And there was a, a beautiful culture that was forming there. Same thing with the with the Atlanta Falcons. We had a beautiful culture, small group of people, pretty easy to build that and reinforce that and, and strengthen that. But then as you have rapid growth, either with Home Depot or as we did with the Blank Family Businesses, it's like, okay, we have a flood of people coming in. Yeah. And how do we how do we grow well and how do we strengthen our culture and instill our culture rather than have it diluted and say, Oh, look what happened. Mm. But boy, this is not a special place at all. Yep. And I'm sure it's not always just black and white of like, oh, this is culture dilution now, or this is awesome, but there's ebbs and flows. Can you think about some practices that you guys instilled that beefed up culture and maybe a couple things that you look back on that were actually agents of culture dilution? Sure. Yeah. So during the process of contemplating, designing, and then opening the stadium, 
there were initiatives that we engaged in to keep everybody involved. Cause even at that point there was rapid hiring going on and even, you know, at the very senior level, uh, some new leadership all of a sudden, you know, at very, very key roles. So this is a cool example. Um, and maybe something even for your future cafes to think about is we had, uh, an innovation lab. We, we went out to an innovation lab, our entire team. Um, uh, and we, you know, you can imagine the post-it notes and the, the markers and, and all the things, but we broke all of our associates into groups and it was all about what should the stadium look like? What should be the inner parts, the inner workings of the stadium from a functional standpoint. Mm. And so we, we, organized into rotating shifts of, okay, um, what, what should, um, the back of house look like, et cetera. And so we were innovating, getting, making people feel engaged and involved in the construction and the design of the stadium. And then even after that, we had sort of a social media, uh, touch point where associates could post pictures. Like if they were out at Disney world and they saw a cool turnstile, they oh, could take cool. a, take a picture of a turnstile and post it in our social me- internal social media site. So if people felt like they were designing the stadium. So I think that was one example of from a innovation and collaboration standpoint, how can we, as we grow, make everyone feel involved? Cause not everybody was in, was involved in the architectural meetings. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. But we were in, in that way. And so then I think when I say culture building, it, a lot of it is celebration and recognition. And so as we grew uh, huddles uh, and uh, calling out when people are living out a core value, celebrating that in a unique way, we, we gave uh, footballs. Uh, that had the the associate's name on them, uh, oh. va- Values and Action Awards. And it, it was a visible, exciting way of saying, you know what, as we grow, look at how we're living our core values. And, and, and so, but with the intentionality of doing that every day, because culture building for me is, it happens every day. It's the language that you use and it's the behaviors that you reinforce and it's all the things that you celebrate. It's the teaching moments. So I think we did that really well. As far as dilution, um, you know, I think you can never do enough in the realm of leadership uh, training because, as I said, we were growing so fast. Uh, just to throw a number out there, we uh, across all of our vendors, we had to hire 4,000 people right before Oof. the stadium opened. So I don't kinda, even know 4,000 people. And no, I don't either. So we, we did that and we, you know, there were some really smart people that helped us do that in a really creative and fun way where we did group interviews and very celebratory and, and really uh, getting people excited about joining the organization. So, but we were hiring people at all levels, very wow. senior levels, uh, mid management levels. And we know the importance of those roles because that's the face of the company is whoever your manager is. That's, that is the company. Mm. So I think over time, rapid growth, you know, you can't do enough in the realm of core values training and, you know, feeding that in. Imagine if we hired, you know, 15 more Ethan's and 15 more Ross's and 15 more Riley's, you're each going to have a different, different spin. So I think, not mm. that you have to be clones of one another, but I think that thread of core values is really key. Okay. There's a lot that you said. That was amazing. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever read the book E-Myth? I have not. You should. Okay. It's really good. It's one of our favorite books. And it, and it, we read it um, right as we were starting this. Mm. And one of the things that he talks about is – having a good mix of being systems led versus people and talent led. And like what I'm hearing in the, the, the progress of when you came onto the Falcons and it was this small group of people that were, you know, like you're all on the same page and the, the organization is working because of who is specifically working there. Mm. And it's like, you, you have this group of tight knit people that's small But then you had to scale up and over the years, I mean, you had to hire more than 4,000 people over (laughs) over your career, obviously. And at that point, you're trying to take the magic that was there when you came on and 
like the the people that were there when you came on, I'm sure some of them are still there, but probably a lot of them aren't, right? Right. Including you. Right. And so at that point, you have to not just rely on a few talented people to make your organization great and functional and magical and inspiring, Mm -hmm. but taking the system, if you will, or the framework uh, or the, the, the things, the, like we talk about this, like a a grapevine has to grow on a trellis, right? Like Mm. a, a structure that is in the vineyard in order for the organic growth to happen. And the trellis or the table or whatever that is that the, the grapevine is growing on is, are the values and the, the guarding principles that scale the magic. Oh, I love that. You know, and you can have that. (laughs) That's a freebie. It's very beautiful too. Um, and so I just find that so interesting that, you know, like in, in our company, we have a lot of really talented people Mm -hmm. and we have a lot of recognizable faces and there's customers that we have that come back to our cafe every day to see specific people. But I hope they stay with us for forever, but they're not. Like the reality is they're not, and we won't always be able to keep everybody in the company. Um, And even with us, like we want our legacy to go on even when we're not with the company, we don't have plans to not be, but one day, you know, so, and I just find that like, that's what values are the it's Mm -hmm. scaling the magic. And I, I want to touch on this thing of, inspiration and like magic and the annoying word to use is like vibe or, or culture or, you know, like all these intangible things that separate one workplace from another. Okay. And you, you've given this example many times where you have, uh, one person who has two jobs at two different places, right? Oh, right, right. Can you can you give us that example and uh, just explain what that means? Mm-hmm. The the two different uh, places that that person works at. Sure. So, I believe in learning through parables or th- through stories because it's more fun, um, and I think it's an opportunity for a leader or a business to look at themselves through a different lens, and so. In my business now, I have a leadership um, experience that um, I go through with with leaders where they can see themselves through a, a very simple story. So one of my stories involves a woman who has accepted two jobs and she works in a gift shop at a hotel or two different hotels. And in one of the hotels, the leadership of that hotel is uh, very much like where I came from, you know, so they made her feel like the CEO of the hotel and they empowered her and they made her feel safe to be herself. And so therefore she blossomed and and did amazing things that the leadership would never even think to ask her to do. Uh, And it was beautiful and memorable and it became a famous hotel because of their hospitality, because they had given people the freedom to be themselves. But to earn extra money, she had uh, coincidentally, a job at another hotel down the street in their gift shop. And the leadership there was very different. It was more um, traditional, older school, where the smartest person in the company is the CEO. And let's maybe even straighten up and be, you know, when when that person comes in the room and it's maybe driven by uh, a checklist of behavior And people are not necessarily encouraged to be themselves, but rather to conform to the job description. So there's, you know, two jobs, but she behaves very differently at the two jobs because one place she feels very free and the other place she feels maybe a little bit fearful. Hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that, that woman gives a completely different level of performance at right. both of those. Right? You almost wouldn't recognize her, you know, at, at the at the hotel with <laughs> the culture that's um, a little bit fear based. Um, she's sweeping the floor and being quiet. And that hotel is therefore not famous for its hospitality. Um, but rather, she's bored because there's not a lot of business. Yeah. 
I want to talk about something around this that we have really sunk our teeth into here that you've taught us. That's moments of delight. Oh. And that is guest facing and uh, inward. I was thinking similarly to your story, I was thinking about what if someone was doing the exact same job at the Carolina Panthers. Oh. And they're working at the stadium and they do their normal job. Boo. <laughs> and they work all year and that's it. And then at the Atlanta Falcons, they work all year and just one day out of the year, they get a football that has their name on it. I'm like, that is just such a tiny thing, but it would probably change their perspective, their lens, mm -hmm. their work for like the whole year. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? I know there's a lot of other variables, but if you just take that for what it's worth, why why do you care about moments of delight and what, what does that mm -hmm. mean to you? That's such a good question. Yeah, and, it, and it's funny. I recently saw, I've been spending more time on LinkedIn lately. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Oh gosh. But um I saw one of my former coworkers had the football as his profile picture. Nice. So yeah. that tells you everything you need to know about totally. that. Totally. Um so yeah, I think moments of delight it's about how you make people feel and as you guys know I'm one of the my core quotes is the Maya Angelou quote people won't remember how what you told them but they'll you'll, they'll remember how you made them feel. And because like with, with the hotel example, she felt a certain way, therefore she behaved a certain way mm -hmm. at, at both hotels. And so moments of delight, uh, I guess I'll just share my definition of that. Delight for me is, is a situation where somebody is surprised uh, by their experience that they've had, so much so that they're compelled to tell another about the experience. And um, in, in a positive way. So that could be from a customer standpoint where somebody comes into Valor and you guys do this so well. Of uh, doesn't have to be huge and heroic necessarily, but they're surprised. Uh, it's something that happens so much so that they're compelled to tell another about it. But I think sometimes employers miss the, the opportunity to delight internally, as Ethan's point is, yeah, I guess you could have two NFL teams the foot, the power of the football, it's the power of thank you. You know, we, these are the things that don't cost much, mm -hmm. but it's funny how sometimes businesses will contemplate, Oh, do we want to spend the money on the football, you know, or whatever it is, Yeah. but the power, you know, it ends up as somebody's profile picture and therefore you, it's an employer brand at that point. You can't afford not to. Yeah. Type thing. So I think the penny wise pound foolish, what? Penny wise, pound foolish means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe that's a generational thing. Penny, you know, it, it, spend a little money to get the, the the bang. Don't be foolish about spending your pennies. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, I I've noticed in your internally facing moments of delight at the Falcons that you guys have played to your strengths of and that strength being people think that the Falcons are cool. Okay. You know, because like, it's like almost this like celebrity level thing that like, Oh, I work for the Falcons, you know? And like that, whoever that is that put that as their profile picture, they want people to know that they work for a like notable celebrity worthy organization. That's like, Oh, it's so cool. Like, I know. cause you know, there's the yeah. players and there's all this clout around it. Yeah. And I think that you could use that, in a maybe selfish way, or you could use that to reinvest in mm. your employees. Mm. You know, like people should be proud that they work for such a, a noteworthy, you know, yeah. organization. The back to the example of the two employers. Mm -hmm. So the employer that is not doing it right. The one that is, you said fear based and like very control based and they're not empowering that employee to, be themselves. I forget all the other things you said, but imagine now in your business that 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 employer brought you on as a consultant okay. with Beyond Culture, which is the name, right? Yes. Beyond Culture. Yes. Um, what? Because I I can 
get in that guy's brain, right? I understand. We all can. And the funny thing is that both employers can be driven by excellence and bottom line Mm -hmm. and the business running well, but it's being expressed in these two completely different ways. One that's bringing life and one that's bringing death. And so it's like they they both care about excellence probably equally. They're just getting to it through different Mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. And so if you were consulting with the employer that is not doing it right, and you've got all these employees that are scared around the boss and they're, uh, you know, whenever the boss comes in, they, they tighten up, but whenever the boss leaves, they don't do a good job because they don't like the boss. Where would you start when you walk into like a a crap show like that? You know, they said, Karen, help us. (laughs) Well, I think that's key that there's the pain point and a desire, you know, so a desire to, to change things. Um, so that very question is what I've been contemplating for the last few years, honestly, because in my spare time, I would pull out my laptop and ask myself those questions is what, how could I help leaders to ask, to ask themselves some, some questions that they could come to their own aha moment? Mm. Uh, because this isn't about telling somebody something, but rather to get them. So that's why I, I like the parables because you can, take your eyes off your own business for a minute, look at a literally like a cartoon that I've created (laughs) myself um, and see, see themselves in the cartoon. So, Oh, I have to tell you this really quick. I had a really surreal moment um, several months ago where I decided to use the cartoon stories in a, in a pretty high profile opportunity where I was standing in front of leaders from around the world that had been flown in for this workshop. And I, you know, kind of doubting myself about using these parables, but they became the powerful language of the day. Yeah. They were, our, these leaders were debating with one another and saying, you're like Hotel A, you're acting <laughs> like Hotel B, you're Claire, you're John, you know, whatever it was. Whoa. But because they, it's easy to s- put yourself in the story. And we've all worked at Hotel A. We've all worked at Hotel B. We've all act like those leaders. So uh, I forgot your question. Where, whenever you're walking into that, Hotel B. Oh yeah, that's yeah, not okay. doing Sorry. it right. Where yeah. do you start? Yeah, so I think this. I have a five week, um, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually just five hours spread out across five weeks, and it's called a visioning experience. And so, if if I'm working with a leader who wants to go on a journey of just exploring the their culture of the organization and maybe a few ways to improve it, I've designed a curriculum that where I don't do a lot of the talking, but it's more asking them questions based on these, the tenets of these stories. And so one of the, the questions that I ask is, uh, what do you, what do you imagine is driving hotel B hotel B is the one, you know, with the, the fear-based culture. And so what are some possible answers? I ask them like, what's driving that individual. And sometimes the answers are, that's just the way they were, they grew up in the business. They, that's just their experience or it could be a need to control, as you said, or fear or insecurity, you name it. But I think what I'm finding in my business is that I go through this experience with them, but then it's a not, it's, it's a long-term relationship. So I can then use the learnings that we had during those awesome conversations that we had over the five weeks to help in the long run, because this isn't a, a sprint, it's a marathon. Hmm. It sounds like basically getting them to agree with you on what their company can and should look like it down is, the road. It is inspirational. Yeah. And I, I guess I'll, I'll say what the beyond in the, in the title means. It's, it's exactly what I said earlier is people can, will surpass your expectations. They will go beyond, way beyond your imagination of what you could even think to ask them to do when you set them to feel up to feel safe and inspired um, that they're just going to go impact the lives of people in, in each day and do it in their own beautiful way. You, you don't know what you're going to get. It's going to go beyond your expectations. I love that. It's one of my greatest joys in our company when, when people go above and beyond what we expected, which happens like every day. It's oh, amazing. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. One of the things that you probably, there's probably, I mean, there's so many things you've taught me, but the thing that you have always said is when somebody asked you to do something at work, always do it. And then a little bit more. And it doesn't have to be much more. It can just like always surpass the expectation by a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I have carried with carried that with me in every job I've been in. And and the jobs that I've been in before owning Valor, like I there was this one time it was my first it was my job at uh, Midland Station, my first coffee job, and the manager like asked me to sweep under the deli uh fridge. bar fridge and it was disgusting mm. and i did that but i thought about what you said and i swept the whole bar and the whole floor and she was like and she knew i was starting a business at the time she was like you are going to be successful because of that like that you're you're always willing to do more than people expect so in your time at, at the falcons what was because okay before i say that I am also amazed by your work ethic. Thank you. And I do not just say this because you're my mom, but I have a more insider look on how you spend your time. You are constantly working. <laughs> no. Like, I see it. I see not, it. Not constantly. Like I, I think you, I don't mean to say that you should give more time to your family because you hang out with us all the time. It's amazing. We have a great relationship. You see my kids all the time, all that. But uh, you, you just... You have boundaries and you take care of yourself, but you can just sit in your room and work on that computer for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, just with that in mind, think about like starting at the Falcons. What what was the specific position you were in? At the Falcons? Yes. Human resources manager in the beginning. And then I changed over the years to changed meaning got promoted to you know director of hr and then director of employee engagement and training things like that yeah so mm -hmm. you moved up in this company as a leader so you were leading and you were also performing like performing a role um what was that process like of being promoted in you know in such a big company like that what what do you think they saw in you that and they deemed you worthy of being promoted. First of all, a shout out to my dad who we lost yep. um, wow. within the last year who taught me that when you are on your job that you should do a little more than what's expected. And so shout out to Mel. The generations. Oh, no. Pass it down. Yes. Uh, You're so, going to teach it to Gigi. Yeah, <laughs> right. I absolutely will. <laughs> That's awesome. So you know, it's funny because I was there a long time. I was almost 20 years and I was the consistent one and I was just the person that was always there. And I was the person that would some, was sometimes nick, nicknamed the values person. I just really bought into and believed in the spirit of Arthur's core values. Yeah. And that's... Um, important. And I'll tell just a, a funny thing, because when I was working for the Falcons, there was a, a short period of time, maybe three or four years, I forget, but it made sense in that moment for a brief period for me to be in a more senior role. So I was reported directly to Arthur. And that didn't make sense after that, because our growth, uh, you know, didn't have the necessarily background to be in the most senior position of that growing, massively growing company. So I happily, you know, pursued in a different, different level. But I, I think, good boy, I learned a lot there too, right? In that, in that time of reporting directly to him. But I think the reason that I was there a long time and the reason that I was pretty well liked is just the consistency and my approachability, my motives were good. And, um, yeah, I, when I'm passionate about something committed to something and I, and I saw the impact, 
as you know, Ross, in being a part of that organization as my son for so many years, we impacted the community, you know, mm-hmm. so there were wonderful times, you know, where we were hands on getting dirty, you know, as far as helping people in the community and looking eyeball to eyeball because Arthur's foundation is just so awesome. And, uh, or, you know, I even had the, the incredible experience of going to Montana and hosting groups of well-deserving, um, associates, uh, out in Montana. And so Arthur was some, is somebody that just walks the talk, you know, it's not core values as we all say they're on the wall, but when he spends an incredible amount of money to send groups of people out to Montana so they can get recentered in, in the Paradise Valley Mountains, you know, that's an incredible blessing. And the reason I got to do things like that was because I was consistent and I was rooted in the values. Simple stuff. Take note. But okay. Your time, you can tell your time at the Falcons is coming to a close, right? Yes. Why start a business so late in your career? Mm -hmm. It's a risky thing to do. Yeah. You know, and there's, there are consultants that are, doing like you're not starting a completely new business that's never been started before. Right. But I can't think of anyone I know that does what you do at the same time. Okay. So it's like, it's a, my point is it's a risk. Mm -hmm. Why start another business late in your career versus like you could probably get a job Mm -hmm. anywhere you want, you know, doing what you were already doing. Mm -hmm. What, what was that decision like? I think it's purpose. I think I'm passionate at this time in my life of sharing, as I said at the start, you know, imparting the wisdom that I've gained and sharing it with small to medium sized businesses who wouldn't maybe normally have access to such. And so I have thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm a person of faith. So I, I've seen that this is, I mean, I have confidence in the success of the business. And so, Hey, why not? Why not pursue a purpose? Why not pursue a passion? And it's just so enjoyable to help extremely grateful people. Hmm. Wow. What motivates you to work so hard? (laughs) Well, there's the, the practical aspect of that, but there's, um, purpose. And I think it's probably the same answer is the joy that comes from helping people. Um, I mean, the customers that I have so far are extremely talented at what they do. They do things that I could never do. Uh, But I think sometimes I'm the missing piece of the pizza that, you know, it's like, okay, well, let me help in this way. Let me share a few things on the people side and as I said, they're so grateful and so hungry that that's a lot more enjoyable. You yeah. know, I mean, I had an awesome time working for Arthur and all of his businesses. And, you know, I mean, we were yelling our heads off at some really cool football games and we, we did some really fun things. And it was an, I'm incredibly grateful for that time in my life. But in some ways, this is more fun. Yeah. Can you share any like transformation stories or? testimonials of your your new time? Yeah. I think I won't list the names, but I, I would just think of businesses that it's a bit of an esteem boost, you know, to all of a sudden now have a set of core values that they didn't have before that were crafted based on input from their, their team members. And what I do is I, I listen to stories that the actual members of the team, I ask them, when has this organization been at its legendary best in five different areas? And so I listen to a ton of stories, ask them a ton of questions, and then I go in on my computer <laughs> <laughs> and crunch all of that information. And then I work with the business owner to say, you know what, you may have had these core values and maybe you copied them off of Google or maybe your competitor or whatever, but let's figure out what the secret sauce of this company really is. And so by, by watching that process, there is an esteem boost for the business to say, 
wow, now I have a framework. I think you mentioned, you know, the vine and the trellis. Now I have the trellis. Now I have the guardrails. Now I have the compass. Now I have whatever you want to call it through which I can make decisions and that I can hire people based on these values. I can ask really great interview questions based on these values. I can onboard people in an inspirational way based on a higher purpose. I can, it's, don't you think people, a people strategy can be very chaotic and random and reactive and fear-based because people people are complex and sometimes people don't know how to handle, navigate, make decisions about people. So by giving somebody their core values and then a framework, because uh, that's what I do basically is the employee life cycle from the beginning of the employment to the end of the employment all the way around the circle is I help businesses activate those core values in a systematic way so that they can build a culture that's amazing. So I, I, I think the success story would be all of a sudden the business has these core values. Their website is revamped. They have a core values wheel hmm. uh, that is on their website. They have an employer brand. They know what questions to ask. It's very empowering. So then they can focus on doing the awesome things that they do in their business. Yeah. There's something that I've heard tons of people say, and it's that, yeah, I love running my business, but the by far the hardest thing and like honestly the biggest headache is my employees. I mean, have you heard people say that? Maybe not those exact words, but I, you know, I I tend to look at things in the opposite way as I know you do is I just turn that upside down and I say, well, you know, they're an opportunity. I I like to tell this one little story because I think it just brings all of this to life is at the stadium as you guys know, we had an associate that felt so safe and so inspired by the orientation program that we took sent people through that she sang on her shift. She sang songs from the beginning of her shift to the end oh, of yeah. her shift. I remember her. And she was nicknamed Singing Linda, and, and uh, she didn't ask permission. We would never ask her to sing. We didn't know she could <laughs> sing. But thank God she did it because yeah. she became a fan favorite. And so at the top of Escalator 1, there was Linda singing her unique songs that she wrote about the Atlanta Falcons, about the Atlanta United. That's amazing. And the, and the fans felt were dazzled and... and and we loved it. So if you multiply that times 4,000 people, they're each going to have their own thing. Some will hug, some will have a high five, some will, you know, greet a widow and give her a, a t-shirt because she lost her husband last week, you know, whatever it is, but you have this beautiful tapestry that is a fan experience. We throw that term around fan experience or customer experience rather. <laughs> What that's how you have an awesome customer experience is by unleashing these people and empowering them to be themselves. So yeah, they can be your biggest headache. Yeah. But I look at that differently. Okay. I want to give a very specific situation to you. Okay. First of all, before I do that, I I think that is what makes magic happen. Is like you just said, like mm -hmm. just getting people to the place where they act as themselves. Right. And yep. it's it's not just about them like smiling and mm -hmm. giving fake service. Like it you know, back to employer B, that that employer B could have this very staunch policy that says you must smile. You must greet people when they walk in the door and when they leave, you have to greet you have to, you know, tell them to have a good day. And that that's probably like 99% of businesses out there that like, even if they do have a policy of greeting people when they walk mm -hmm. in or smiling or even a, a script of like, how's your day going? People, guests just see right through that. And, you know, Lin singing Linda, they, they, you guys don't have a policy that says you must sing or you must act in a way that's unique to you and inspiring to the company and others. Mm -hmm. There's not any of that. It's all more of a strategic approach where yes you arrive at that end mm -hmm. but in order for a place to feel magical and feel genuine you just have to take the steps to unlock and like you said unleash that in people and and I, what i have to share about that is like okay well how would how could you possibly make people feel that way well i will tell you this when we first had um the super the our first crop of stadium supervisors. We invited them in. This was our very first opportunity to train the future leaders of the stadium. 
And so we had cons- some incredibly smart consultants that helped us with this. So we did not dream this up on our own. But it was all about Maya Angelou of how, how are we going to make these people feel? Mm-hmm. Well, we want these people to feel like kings and queens mm-hmm. and CEOs. You know, they may have accepted a job of concession supervisor, but no, we wanted them to feel like... CEOs. So the in, the entire experience was crafted in that way from where are they going to park and then where are the cheerleaders going to stand so that they can have their pom-poms and greet them and show them where to walk in. And this was at Arthur's uh, Howell Mill office, which looks like a French chateau. So, I mean, these people were dazzled from the minute they looked at the building. Wow. And then they came in and it's an incredible facility on the inside. It's even prettier than the outside. So from the food that we fed them all day at the new hire orientation training, the food that we fed them, the champagne toast at the end and the, the gifts that were waiting for them, uh, the guest speakers, Arthur speaking to them in person, uh, the core values, uh, experiential inspirational training. Yeah. They left on top of the world, many of them in tears. And that's what, unleashes singing Linda. Incredible. We got to get a chateau, man. Right. And there's so many people. So like I said earlier, <laughs> you've, you've got this very high profile organization that what you're doing there is playing to your strengths. Right. But there's so the majority of people don't have a chateau. You know, they don't have the budget to do all of that, but there's still still so many ways because you know what? New hire orientation, I think, typically consists of an I-9 form. Yeah. <sighs> Usually, yeah. Boring. And, and so I tend to look at that as like, what's the higher purpose of this organization? What gets people out of bed in the morning? Why does this exist? I don't care if you're a dry cleaner or, or a hardware store or a coffee company or whatever. There is a higher purpose to this. And so let's inspire people to step into that higher purpose and live out the values. So I want to talk about uh, employee drama, okay? Mm-hmm. Because th- this will probably be one of the last things we talk about. We're almost out of time. Let's end on a drama note. Yes. I, I'll have an ending question. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Awesome. So whenever I hear people, business leaders say, I love my business, but the thing that's the biggest headache is the employees. A lot of the times what they're talking about is peer-to-peer conflict. And peer-to-peer conflict is inevitable. It's it, and then we we've dealt with it. I think that we have definitely seen a very easy version of what most people see. Mm-hmm. Um, but as an HR person, you've got two people that have a conflict and that they are in your care, right? And their peers, there's. Uh, one of them has hurt the other person emotionally or there's communication issues or, you know, but, but, and they're both like, for lack of a better term, complaining to you about the other person. Mm. How do you navigate that? Mm-hmm. Cause we've tried a lot of different methods mm-hmm. and I, I think all of them have been great. You know, like no, it's, I, I, I learned from you in this regard. It's all it. Like I said, I don't, I'm not saying we've had a lot of problems with this, but it's just inevitable that this will happen wherever mm-hmm. you work. So, you know, we've tried like getting them together. We've tried because you don't want to be like, hey, this person is is saying all this bad stuff about you. What do you have to say about it? And then that person is like, oh, well, and then the, you're just this middle man. You know, mm-hmm. how how have you dealt with that in mm-hmm. the past and seen the best outcome? Probably all of those things. I think uh, this is not rocket science, but I think a lot of it comes down to motive and seeking first to understand. So as humans, we we tend to uh, fill in the gap with a negative. And so we assume a negative motive. But then later, you know, when we're given the opportunity to hear somebody out, we realize, oh, maybe I was I was too quick to assume that motive, like maybe the motive was better than what I thought. Um, and so I think giving space to hear each other out, but maybe that's after talking with each person individually, people want to vent, people want to be heard. Yeah. So giving people the opportunity to vent, be heard. Uh, let's look underneath, peel back the onion, look at the motive 
And, and so maybe it's talking with them separately and then, and then giving them some time together to realize that hopefully the motives were good. And uh, seeking first to understand is just something that I say to myself all the time is like, let's, let's ask some good questions. Let's ask questions before we tell, you know, and I think nine times out of 10 by asking good questions, giving people space to talk, looking for the motive for each individual person, you're probably going to be able to navigate that pretty well. So I think the, the, the leader or the HR person with whoever it is, is, is setting that up, facilitating that probably not just like, I mean, sure, there can be some coaching or life experience that you're sharing like, Hey, and I tend to do this a lot as, but I've been there, boy, I've done, I've, I've been sat right in your seat and I've made that. I, I've thought that, but here's what I learned from it. Sometimes that helps. So, but you know what, I, I've dealt with some of those situations that are probably some of the most difficult ones, uh, that I've ever dealt with involving very, like years and years and years of misunderstandings. And then I've dealt with ones that were pretty simple, but you know, sometimes it does end with people not working in the same locate in the same, for the same company because of an inability to, to get along, you know, so despite everybody's best efforts, despite, you know, rounds and rounds and rounds of, of trying, you know, sometimes the damage can be so great and that's very sad, but the business can't be crippled by that yeah. inability. Hmm. I, I have always loved how you, first of all, you're very wise. Thank you. But your wisdom does not come from just espousing principles and philosophies and uh, all this life experience and stuff that you've had. Mm -hmm. It comes from truly being effective, which is asking the right questions and getting people to, uh, to come to the intended outcome. You know, it, you, I just see you as you don't, you don't feel the need to be someone who just gives speeches and monologues. You, you're, I think you, the reason you're so effective is because you don't do that. You can do that and you do do that sometimes when it's necessary, but you'd never need to. Oh, I appreciate that. And I, it, it really comes from experiential learning and just feeling passionate about some powerful truths that I've encountered in my career. Mm -hmm. One aspect of this that I think we've carried from you is your emphasis on objectivity Oh, yeah. uh, in situations yeah. because the imagination is so powerful when it's mm -hmm. charged with a lot of emotions and you can like hear a story and it's like, and it was like this and they're saying like this and it, and it was like this and this and you're like, whoa, wait, wait, wait. what, what actually happened? Mm -hmm. What, what was, what were the words that they used mm -hmm. that was said? And then it's like, oh man, this situation just went from like a nine out of 10 to like a four out of 10. I'm like, all right, I think you just filled in a lot of blanks here. Oh, that's good. Let's start from here mm -hmm. and then start seeking first to understand on those that's, words. That's really true. Yeah. So thank you for that. We've yeah, wow. we've used that a lot. Ross, Ross is very uh, good at that and even reminded me of that too. Mm -hmm. What I was going to ask was let's, let's all go in our imaginations and say that tomorrow you're getting interviewed for a big new job by the same guy that interviewed you for the Falcons. Oh. And he asked you, Karen, oh. what, are you, what are you passionate about? I'm passionate. Thank you, Ethan. I'm passionate about, um, I think about this guy and I don't even remember his name, but I was involved with welcome home training, which I know you guys know what welcome home training is. That's what our consultants helped us to do uh, to create as a new higher orientation program for the stadium when it opened. And I, I did a lot of these trainings and I enjoyed all of them and they were all unique. They were uh, four hours long and they were basically activating Arthur's core values in an experiential way in the room. And so people would come in the room uh, the the new hires would come in the room, maybe about a hundred people at a time and they would have their nose in their phone and they were maybe a little shy and didn't talk to one another. And they would sit at the tables and I'm at the podium and they didn't really know what they had in store. They had accepted a position, um, but they didn't I don't think they really knew what they had stepped into. But over the four hours, they were 
getting to know each other at the heart level, because this is not about the head, it's about the heart. And so over the course of the four hours, they realized that they had stepped into something special, that they really were the CEO and that they were being asked and begged to create moments of delight and to impact the lives of our guests in a, in a great way. And I just remember this young guy who had been pretty quiet throughout the four hours. But at the end, I would always say, who has a takeaway? You know, I'd always enjoyed hearing the takeaways. And he spoke and he said, I've never worked somewhere where they've asked me to be myself. Mm. I've, I've always worked at places where they told me what to do. And he was in disbelief. And I, I, know, I don't even know whatever happened to him. But yeah. I, I, I'd like to think that he got comfortable and that he did some things that were, that were sincere for him to impact the lives of our guests. And so I'm passionate about that. I'm passionate about people all around our town. You know, I encounter a lot of really interesting customer service experiences, as I'm sure you do. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself, what's behind that? And so uh, why am I doing this right now? It's to make the world a better place one business at a time. I know it sounds corny, but I, I think uh, it's, it's a worthy of my time. Is it okay if I share uh, the, the text that you sent me? <laughs> Sure. Uh, cause you're pretty savage sometimes, <laughs> um, but you're always right. So that's, that's the thing. So she sent me a, a picture of the outside of this unnamed business <laughs> and it says, there's a sign that says, join our team, uh, flexible schedules, growth opportunities, associate discount and more. And then right beside that, there's a overflowing trash can. <laughs> and there was another one on the other side of it. It was like bookends. Yeah. yeah, that's just funny how uh, it's like, what do you think is the breakdown there? Like if, mm -hmm. if you were to help that that company? Uh, I talked to Madeline about it uh, because she was there with me. Apathy, uh, lack of vision, <laughs> blind spot, yeah. um, understaffed. Um, so it's probably all those things, lack of leadership. But I, I, I can't put my finger on it, but it was just a little bit ironic. I don't think anybody had the time to see it or the vision to see that the overflowing trash cans, what message is that saying, not only to the customer, but to the people that they're trying to attract? Mm. Yeah, you said, am I being too much of a Karen to point out the sad irony and lack of leadership <laughs> at play here? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. The you guys coffee do an awesome sometimes. Job. You, you're doing a great work. Uh, through Thank Valor, you, uplifting people through coffee. That's yes. right. Can you please come back on our show? Oh, sometime. Yes, as long as Riley's here too. Okay, <laughs> we'll we'll have to arrange that. We can make that happen. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. What a what a treat. You really have shaped our company more than most. Oh, oh yeah. Thank you. So many I, different little. I know things. it's it's but you guys are very well read and have a lot of mentors. So I'm proud of all of you. All right, guys, Riley from the future here. I just sat down and edited this podcast and had a really good time listening to it. So thank you to Karen, uh, definitely one of my biggest idols in life. Uh, we appreciate you being on the show, and we love you so much. Uh, I am interjecting here because it looks like we forgot to get Karen's contact information. So it'll also be down in the notes or the description. But uh, if you want to reach out to Karen and hit her up about helping your company uh, develop some awesome values. And I, I promise, promise you, you'll be better for it. Um, you can reach her by emailing info at karenwalters.com or just by visiting her website, karenwalters.com. That's K-A-R-E-N-W-A-L-T-E-R-S.com. I'm, again, sad I wasn't in this one, but I had a good time listening to it. So I'm gonna let them wrap the show. Love y'all. Thank you. And those of you listening, it would be awesome if uh, you comment on this video on YouTube with one of your takeaways. What is what is one way that wow. what was discussed on this podcast has altered your mindset or or made you think uh, in a certain way? Because I, I have always known that that is the best way to retain information and grow from information that you got was like to process it and to say this was something I, you know, I took away. Especially Colson. 
Oh, we yeah. want to hear from Colson. I cannot wait. Colson, how <laughs> does this read. apply to your, uh, where, where does he work? He, I don't know the name, but he sells <laughs> uh, electric car charging stations. Because it applies there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, everywhere. Big time. Uh, but yeah, thank you again. Yeah, there's humans there. Uh, I love you. I love you. I love you guys, too. Absolutely. Lovely. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.